signal. So concretely, we are using clicky integrate and fire spiking neurons. Uh, we are using spike time dependent plasticity to uh, learn weights uh, between these neurons. Uh, so these two um, things are, uh, I guess, relatively well known to most of the people here. Uh, these are standard things. Uh, and the last thing is deep feedback control. Um, this is an existing work, maybe less uh, less known, fairly recent, on how to train uh, networks uh, of neurons in uh, without backprop essentially. Uh, so using a method that is local in uh, space and time. Uh, it is inspired by control theory, but also has interesting uh, explanations from bioplausibility side. Uh, so this is based on work by Millmans and others uh, in the paper from 2021. Uh, so first I'm going to start explaining our method uh, from just a single neuron. Uh, and then after that, we'll go to uh, whole networks and th then I'll explain how from one neuron, uh, we can connect them and learn uh, on the scale of the full neural network with multiple layers. Uh, but here, let's just look at this one neuron, uh, which we're calling C. Uh, it has connections to, uh, it has incoming connections from two neurons, A and B. And I'm going to follow the work by Pao here, who did, who applied similar method to rate-based uh, spiking networks and here in our case uh, we are doing uh, event-based uh, kind of binary uh, spiking uh, dynamics uh, so we are using traditional leaky integrate and fire neurons um, here is the sort of relatively standard equation uh, of how action potential changes in time there is leakage term uh, then the responses from uh, incoming uh, neurons are weighted by the weights that we want to learn and the novel thing here is uh, this control input uh, that kind of drives learning uh, for the neuron that I'm going to explain later. Um, and yeah, we are using standard leaky integrate and fire with threshold. Uh, so when nothing happens, uh, the action potential is decaying. When there are incoming spikes, it is increasing. If we reach the threshold, we are going to spike and we are going to enter the refractory period. Uh, so just to give a simple example of how uh, this would work with uh, spike time dependent plasticity, let's imagine binary classification case where there is class zero, where we want uh, the neuron C to give no spikes and class one, uh, where we want neuron C to give spikes. Uh, so let's say in class zero, uh, neuron B is active and, and on class one, neuron A is active. Uh, so then we are going to define the control in such a way uh, that uh, on class one, when our neuron C is not spiking, the control is going to be positive and it's going to drive neuron C to spike more. Uh, then a STDP will trigger, uh, it will uh, essentially compare uh, spike, spike times uh, with neuron A. Uh, and based on that, since they're spiking together as a weight from neuron A to C is going to increase and vice versa. Uh, here, uh, when neuron B is spiking, we are going to give uh, negative control to uh, neuron C, and STDP is going to decrease uh, the weight from B to C. Uh, so this is how it works with uh, just one neuron. Uh, in our case, we want to learn uh, multi-layer feedforward networks. Uh, and deep feedback control is an existing method that was applied previously. Uh, coming from this paper by Millmans and others. Uh, it was applied previously to rate-based uh, networks and we are applying it to kind of event-based spiking networks. Uh, again, this is a credit assignment method that's local in space and time. It's inspired by control theory. Uh, so rough idea is uh, uh, there is some control uh, that depends on what the network, network outputs and what uh, the ground truth target is. So this is a supervision signal. And uh, this supervision signal essentially guides uh, all the neurons uh, in the network uh, in terms of how to spike. Uh, again, we are using uh, 
uh, leaking integrated fire uh, networks. So this is the same equ equation essentially in our upper layer uh, with weights, uh, uh, fit forward weights in each layer. Uh, and the only new thing is now uh, this control is applied uh, to each layer using uh, kind of pure layer feedback weight, uh, which we call Q here. Uh, so Q can be uh, either learned in a separate stage or can be just estimated from forward weights. Uh, but also one interesting thing is here for us in practice, it can be just set to fixed values and this is still going to work, which sort of resembles uh, uh, methods like feedback alignment. Uh, so it's actually not necessary for us to learn these weights. Uh, this method, uh, in theory, approximates uh, nonlinear optimization methods uh, under mild conditions for uh, rate-based uh, neurons, which is shown in the paper. In our case, we apply it together with DDP uh, and spiking dynamics. So it's not obvious what the theory for it is, but in the end, we show that it works out in practice. And next, I'm going to explain how exactly we define uh, control uh, for uh, event-based uh, binary spikes. Uh, so this is fairly simple, uh, let's say on MNIST data set where you need to class, uh, classify uh, into 10 classes and you need to give, predict which digit it is. Uh, we have uh, one hot target that is one out of 10. Uh, and we also will have 10 output neurons uh, 10, uh, that are going to give binary spikes. Uh, so then uh, in each of these 10 dimensions, we can just compare output and target uh, so when output is not spiking and target is also zero, uh, we do nothing, uh, we don't update the control. Uh, and when the output is not spiking and we want, we want it to spike, we give uh, a positive signal there. Uh, and the other way around, when uh, we spike and the target should be no spike, uh, we give negative control. And uh, in the last case, when we spike and the target uh, is uh, also or spike, uh, we keep positive signal just to kind of maintain the dynamics to maintain the spiking rates in the network. Um, so just given this uh, this equation, we can essentially run everything uh, running STDP in parallel that will update weights uh, in kind of uh, non-local in space and time manner. Uh, so it doesn't require any synchronization, but obviously in practice we can simulate it uh, with you know various common methods with discrete time steps. So in practice we evaluated on MNIST dataset, which is a common benchmark. Uh, we compare it with uh, traditional artificial neural networks trained with backprop uh, net networks of the same size. Uh, so here we do it in three settings with just one layer. Uh, two layers and three layers. Uh, our method is in blue uh, and traditional backdrop is in orange. So you can see we achieve comparable accuracy, uh, slightly worse. Uh, one uh, limitation of our work is that with more layers, uh, as we can see here, uh, it becomes harder to train these networks to apply this method. So you see accuracy drops a bit, where for backdrop it should either stagnate or improve a bit. Uh, so uh, it is less trivial to train deeper networks uh, with this method, mainly because of, kind of approximation nature of the DFC method. Uh, so this is still work in progress for us. Uh, but uh, at the moment, we are already comparable to roughly what NN can achieve on this uh, data set. And the other experiment that we do uh, is to demonstrate uh, that uh, uh, actually, our networks are fast as they uh, achieve fast temporal encoding. So concretely by that, we mean that uh, in inference time, after we train the network, uh, we are going to get the correct spike uh, with low latency. Uh, so we are really in the kind of event-driven spiking mode rather than rate-based mode. Uh, so here I'm going to show kind of three examples. Uh, first is in the beginning of training, the next one is in the middle of training, and final is after the training, uh, which kind of demonstrates how things evolve uh, during training with more more training epochs. 
So in all these cases, we are presenting a single input, which is image one, uh, image of digit one from the MNIST, the same image. Uh, and we just demonstrated for uh, 20 time steps uh, to the network in all the cases. Uh, so as you can see, initially in the very beginning of training, uh, it's not uh, very accurate. Uh, a lot of things are spiking. Uh, however, if we uh, take uh, kind of the average rate of spike, uh, the correct uh, the correct output uh, one uh, is going to be the one that spikes the most. Uh, but we need to run it for kind of multiple time steps, uh, which is not uh, not really what we want from spiking networks. Uh, so it has initially sort of rate based properties. As we do more training, uh, we'll see that uh, one thing start to spike earlier. Uh, so here we get a spike at time step one, and uh, uh, it's still sort of in the rate based mode uh, where we need to uh, ideally average our several time steps uh, to, uh, to realize which one is the correct one. Uh, but towards the end, the end of training, after training, we typically will get spikes immediately on the very first time step, uh, and uh, the other other outputs are not spiking. So we are kind of completely purely in in the mode with temporal fast and correct encoding, which is potentially interesting for neuromorphic folks. And here, just repeating this experiment, uh, averaging over uh, multiple samples. Uh, we'll see that latency, the time until the time it takes the network to produce the first spike is decreasing with more training steps. And uh, the accuracy that we get from the very first spike, uh, which we call uh, this while uh, act first, uh, is uh, quickly converging to the accuracy that we get by kind of rate based evaluation of averaging uh, the number of spikes over 20 time steps. Uh, so initially, uh, there is a huge gap between them. So the performance is obviously miserable for uh, the first spike, uh, but for rate, there is already some uh, kind of significant uh, performance improvement in the beginning, uh, but there is still a huge gap. Uh, however, eventually this gap is uh, decreasing as uh, fast temporal encoding is emerging there. So yeah, in summary, uh, we uh, uh, we uh, evaluated uh, kind of a new algorithm that combines uh, spike time-dependent plasticity, event-based spiking net uh, spiking neurons, and a method that is local in space and time uh, to train multi-layer hierarchical networks. Uh, this is maybe potentially interesting for neuromorphic implementations in the future. Uh, it creates low latency networks, uh, it implements uh, first spike coding, uh, and accuracy so far uh, is close to ANS and backpropagation. So, thanks. Uh, let's go to questions. All right, thank you, Alex, uh, for this talk. Uh, let's go straight to the questions. The first one is by Karim Habashi. Um, and it is, what are the biological mechanisms that might approximate this approach? Uh, yeah, I'm not a biology expert. Uh, I would refer to the original paper here by Millmans, where they actually explain, like, uh, for example, in this case, uh, what uh, essentially what are the bioplausible uh, bioplausible elements that can implement uh, this uh, the control signal. So I'd rather not to go into that myself uh, to not say something wrong. Uh, but yeah, I really recommend this paper by Millman's on DFC. Okay. Also, I think on the same slide, um, did uh, so this question is by myself. Did I understand correctly in this case that the feedback that the neurons get, uh, essentially this Q post C term, is uh, scales with the number of layers? And if that's the case, doesn't this massively slow down the training compared to backdrop? Uh, so. Uh, the, uh, if I understand the question correctly, when we apply uh, uh, this uh, feedback to the layer, we just multiply it once by QI. So for la for layer I, we only take C of T and we multiply it with QI. So we don't we don't have to like multiply 
all the layers until the end. So like there is no backpropagation, sort of like essentially no reverse propagation at all. But let me try to, sorry, I'm taking my privilege as the chair yeah. to refine my question. But as you go forward from one layer to the controller and back, that's one cycle, right? So basically one feedback cycle needs to propagate through all the layers of the network. Is that correct? Hello? Okay, can uh, you... Yeah, I, I, I see the question. Mm, let me think. So maybe I, I don't get the question completely, uh, but I, I think don't, I... don't, Yeah, don't worry about it. I can... Uh, uh... Yeah. I can come and grill you in Zurich next time when I come, when I come there. <laughs> sure. All right, so the next uh, question is, uh, sorry, it's also by myself. Um, so what's the explanation for the fast temporal coding? Uh, so as far as I can explain it, uh, it's uh, just sort of emerging property coming out of uh, STDP and just leaking integrating fire. Uh, binary networks, so we are not like uh, we are not using uh, rates as a, as a floating point value. I just use binary uh, binary outputs. And uh, then I think it's coming out from the way how we define control. Uh, so in some sense, uh, if we integrate it over time, uh, there sort of is encouragement for the whole network to spike uh as soon as possible i think partially it's coming from this last uh last part of the table where if things spike we still give uh we still give correct uh, we still give like plus one uh to the control update so essentially things are encouraged at the same time to spike sort of more uh, but by this negative part things are encouraged also to spike correctly and then this thing emerges uh, but like we don't have theoretical proof for that. This is just practical way to see that this thing is emerging, which yeah would be interesting to derive why exactly it is coming. So. I agree. I'll do a very. I think there's a quick question. So the the feedback weights, which I assume are the Q. And by the way, this question is from Thomas Novotny. These feedback weights are chosen randomly. Uh, so one way how we do it, uh, the most kind of simple way. Uh, they are chosen as the transpose of the forward matrix at the initialization point. So initially, we initialize this W randomly, and we take Q as the transpose. Uh, so this is inspired by the DFC paper, which shows that the, with uh, weights that are transposed, uh, some theoretical convergence properties are emerging. Uh, however, they they truly would emerge if you were, if you reinitialize this after each uh, forward weight update. But we we only do it once initially uh, using transpose of this random matrix. So it is sort of random, uh, but it's kind of dependent on uh, what the forward weights are. So it's not not exactly a feedback alignment where it will be completely random, independent of the forward uh, forward weight. Uh, but it's almost that. All right, um, so we have to move on to the next uh, speaker. Alex, thank you very much for your uh, talk. Yep, thanks. And thanks for the questions. Happy to talk more about it.